managing to stop people from being tortured or killed. What could be more rewarding or more important than that? And so in this book, I describe what it was like to lead amnesty missions in war zones as I did in Liberia, Northern Ireland, and Darfur, Sudan, to be threatened with assassination as I was in Liberia, or to have four rifles pointed at you by drugged up elementary school kids as happened on the way to the airport in Darfur, Sudan. Not pleasant memories. I outline Amnesty's work to close Guantanamo Bay and end police misconduct and the death penalty, and I recount my encounters with Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio and Bill O'Reilly, and my acquaintances with everyone from Lauren Bacall to Ted Kennedy, Salma Hayek to Richard Gere, Patrick Stewart to Bianca Jagger. Bianca Jagger, this last relationship did not get off uh, on an auspicious <laughs> note. I had invited Bianca Jagger, you know who she is, uh, the former wife of Mick Jagger, but indeed uh, a very proficient and powerful human rights advocate. I had invited her to lunch at one of the most elegant restaurants in New York City because I knew that despite her commitment to human rights, she did like the better things in life. And I, I wanted to try to convince her to work with Amnesty. And when we sat down at our prominently situated table, I thought to myself, what's a kid from Pittsburgh doing having a private lunch with Bianca Jagger? Don't, don't blow this, Bill. And a few moments later, the waiter brought us a complimentary dish of orange salmon mousse, which I offered to Bianca, who took a demure bite. I then picked up a cracker, scooped up some mousse, and promptly spilled it down the front of my suit and tie. <laughs> and hoping that Bianca hadn't noticed, I quickly covered my front with my napkin, but she was too fast for me. Oh, darling, she said in her magnificently accented English, you have just spilled mousse all over your tie. Thank you, Bianca. <laughs> so I tell a lot of stories in this book that I think readers will enjoy, but I also try to address such important topics as what is the nature of evil? How do we foster the better angels of our natures? When should we use force to stop human rights crimes? And most importantly, how do we who care about the world sustain hope in the face of the atrocities that we confront or at least hear about every day. And tonight, that's what I want to talk about, the answer to the question that I was asked most frequently when I served at Amnesty. Namely, given all the horrors in the world, all the torture, killing, and cruelty, how do you retain any hope at all in humanity? What reason is there to believe that the human rights experiment can ultimately help redeem humanity? Whenever I received this question, and it was remarkable that it came constantly, whenever I received this question, I always felt embarrassed and ashamed because the questioner assumed that I had somehow managed not to be benumbed to the heartache that I saw and heard about constantly. 24 hours after I assumed the job in March of 1994, I learned about the Mujahideen in Afghanistan who tortured their war prisoners in an ingenious way. They tied them to corpses of soldiers they had already killed and let both the dead prisoner and the live one rot together in the relentless sun. If I was being if I was being entirely honest, I would have to say that I was often highly defended emotionally against truly feeling the misery I encountered. Shouldn't I be perpetually on the verge of tears? Ought I to emulate the nightclub guests in Gunter Grass's The Tin Drum who pay for the privilege of cutting up onions in order to make themselves cry? Well, defended or not, I did retain hope in humanity, hope in human rights, and I want to tell you why. 
For all the setbacks that the human rights regimen has experienced, for all the Putins and Xi's and Orban's and, dare I say, Trump's in the world, for all the suffering in American and Chinese and Russian prisoner, prisons, in Myanmar and Palestine, Afghanistan and the Central African Republic and on the streets of American cities, despite all this, the cosmopolitan ideal upon which human rights are based, the notion that at the end of the day, what human beings share in common is more important than what divides us, and that therefore we need to respect one another despite our differences and play by the same rules. This is the cosmopolitan ideal, and that ideal is not dead. In fact, it is the prevailing normative sentiment of worldwide culture. Now, how can I say that? How can I say that that cosmopolitan ideal is the prevailing normative sentiment of worldwide culture? Because the behavior of tyrants gives the game away. Why does Vladimir Putin pretend that he was elected democratically? Why does he deny that he poisoned his political opponent, Alexei Navalny? Why did he frame his invasion of Ukraine as a project in denazification, as a means to protect the right of Russians in eastern Ukraine? Why? Because even Putin knows that if he has any chance of retaining a smattering of allies around the world, if he has any chance of justifying his actions to the Russian people, those actions had to be framed in terms of a defense of civilized values, of the civilized values that are the predominant norm, even in a country like Russia, much less in the broader international community. Or let's take other examples. Why does China's Xi Jinping label his detention camps, and there are over 200,000 Chinese being held in detention camps, why does he label his detention camps, and I'm quoting, friendly vocational training centers? If he's proud of his re-education through labor camps, why doesn't he advertise them on Chinese television? Why did Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salman pretend that he had nothing to do with the dismembering of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi? If Khashoggi was an evildoer, why not trumpet his just desserts? Why does Hungary's Viktor Orban call himself an illiberal Democrat? but still a Democrat, rather than a self-avowed authoritarian. Why does the Myanmar military insist that it will eventually introduce free elections? Don't worry. When was the last time a country invited CNN into its torture chambers? Certainly, Genghis Khan or Tamerlane or Lenin or Idi Amin would have had no such compunctions, even though it was said that tears came into Lenin's eyes every time he heard Beethoven's Appassionata. Well, I could offer dozens more examples of the subterfuges engaged in by the world's tyrants, but the key question is why? Why do these powerful masters of the universe want to hide their dirty deeds? The answer is because they know that their actions are at odds with the defining characteristics of a civilized society. Sometimes there will be consequences for their evil deeds, internal or external. Young people in the streets, corporations too skittish to make investments, allies too embarrassed to maintain relations, an indictment by an international or domestic court, often there will be no consequences, but the autocrat can never be sure. And consequences or not, 
the norms, the cosmopolitan ideal, the norms and the shame and the worry remain. Occasionally, even some of the most brutal human rights criminals let slip their veil of indifference to the potential burnt harvest of cruelty. Here are two examples. General Paul Osiris was a frequent employer of torture during the French-Algerian War, and he was a prominent defender of the use of torture after the war. But in his 2001 memoir, The Battle of the Casbah, he recounts a telling conversation that he had with a doctor over the dead body of an Algerian prisoner who he had just killed by waterboarding. This is what he says. I called in the doctor who was an old friend of mine from school days in Bordeaux. I was talking to the prisoner and he fell ill, I said unconvincingly. He told me he had tuberculosis. Can you see what's wrong with him? You were talking to him, said the doctor. But he's drenched. You must be kidding me. No, no, I said. I wouldn't do such a thing. But he's dead, said the doctor. Well, it's possible, I answered. But when I called for you, he was still alive. Since the doctor was still complaining, I lost my cool. And I said, and so you want me to say that I killed him? Would that make you feel better? Do you think I enjoy this? No, said the doctor, but then why did you come to get me if he's dead? I didn't answer. The doctor finally understood. I had called him so that he would send the body to the hospital and get it out of my sight once and for all. Or consider this testimony of a truck driver before the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, who had just arrived at the scene of a massacre by Bosnian Serb soldiers of a group of bound and blindfolded Muslim men. This is what the truck driver reported in his testimony to the criminal tribunal. In that heap, in that pile of dead bodies, who did not resemble people any longer, this was just a pile of flesh in bits, and then a human being emerged. I say a human being, but it was actually a boy of some five to six years. It's unbelievable, unbelievable. A human being came out and started moving towards the path, the path with the path where men with automatic rifles stood doing their job. And this child was walking toward them. All of those soldiers and policemen there, these people had had no trouble shooting. Perhaps they had shot the boy's father, who knows? But all of a sudden, the boy kept walking, and all of a sudden, the soldiers lowered their rifles. And all of them, to the last one, just froze. Shoot the boy, said their commander, shoot him. But none of the soldiers would lift their rifles, and the commanding officer didn't shoot him either. They just turned the child over to me, and I took him to the hospital. Now, why didn't General Paul Osiris revel in killing his Algerian prisoner? Why did the Bosnian soldiers just freeze? Because on some level, Osiris knew that what he was doing was wrong. On some level, the soldiers knew that to kill the little boy 
was a bridge too far, too far beyond the norms of civility into the wilderness of the monstrous. Many people will ask, I have been asked this question literally hundreds of times, what good do moral norms and human rights standards do if they can be violated with such flagrant, unabashed impunity? It's a good question. But an equally good question is, where would we be without them, without those norms and standards? Do we really want to live in a world in which killing your political enemies, cleansing your nation of ethnic minorities, and torturing your captives are not behaviors subject to rebuke? Do we prefer a world in which exploitation of the poor and harsh treatment of the powerless are considered things to be proud of? If the standard for hope is the appearance of a perfectly just world, hope is doomed, I admit it. But I'm not looking for a perfectly just world. I'm looking for a less unjust one. I'm not looking for a world of pure virtue. I'm looking for a world with just a little less wickedness. If the goal is not a perfect world, but a less unjust one, I think the odds in its favor are maybe 60-40. Indeed, if we take the measure of our world in generations and not year to year, I think the odds improve on 60-40. Consider this. In 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted, more than 50% of the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, that number is less than 10%. In 1948, the death penalty was in widespread use around the world. Today, almost three quarters of the world's nations have abolished the death penalty. Freedom House has noted that the number of countries it considers not free has grown by nine in the past 15 years. And that's something worrisome, absolutely. But do you know how many democracies there were in 1948? There were 20 of them. Today, there are more than 100. In the 1940s, 60% of African American women worked as domestic servants. Today, that percentage is 2.2%, with 60% in white collar jobs. In 1948, no woman had ever headed a government. There were no international conventions that prohibited genocide, torture, racial discrimination, or any number of other grievous wrongs. The world had not agreed that any of those things were bad. And even Eleanor Roosevelt, who chaired the committee that authored the Universal Declaration and was apparently herself involved in a lesbian relationship, even Eleanor Roosevelt could not have fathomed that marriage might not be reserved for a man and a woman. Perhaps no other human rights arena better illustrates the advances that have been made since 1948 than that of international justice. The Nuremberg trials established the principle that war crimes and crimes against humanity could be prosecuted even, even if a country's own laws did not impose a penalty for those crimes. But there was no established ongoing mechanism to enforce that. As of 2020, the two war crimes tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, as well as the International Criminal Court, had indicted 289 people and convicted 159 of them of genocide war crimes and crimes against humanity. 159 people who would not otherwise have been punished. Now obviously 159 people is far fewer than the number of people who actually have committed such crimes. 
But as the historian Adam Chalkschild has said, international tribunals can only be symbolic and selective. Such was the case in Nuremberg, which brought the charges against, remember, only 24 top Nazis. And yet no one has ever called Nuremberg insignificant. 159 people. And just as importantly, the principle of universal jurisdiction, the notion that any national court anywhere in the world may try a suspect for serious breaches of international law, even if that suspect is not a citizen of that state, this is being applied more and more frequently by European courts. As of 2020, Belgium, for example, had tried five cases related to the Rwandan genocide and continues to take alleged genocidiers into custody more than 25 years after the genocide. In the summer of 2021, a Swedish court began hearing a case related to the massacre of 5,000 prisoners under the orders of the newly elected Iranian president, Ibrahim Raisi. Now, the point of all this is not to sow satisfaction for I know as well as anyone that many hideous just injustices remain. But I also know two things about history. First, I know that history is not determined by either the whims of an angry God or the prophecies of an economic fate, that it is shaped by a thousand things, but among those are human hands, by the hands of those who keep the faith even in the midst of their weeping. And second, I know that history is not, as Aldous Huxley supposedly said, history is not just one damn thing after another. <laughs> history builds upon itself. One generation's experience influencing another for good or ill. The fact that human beings had the imagination to envision the human rights ideal in the first place, the cosmopolitan ideal, means that we know where we want to go even if we stumble in the process. We know through long centuries of trial and error what it means to act with honor. Barbarism is not inevitable. Benevolence is not impossible. And hope is not a pipe dream if we build on the wisdom of our ancestors and try to make the world not perfect, but just a bit more kind. I called this memoir, Reversing the Rivers, after a quote from the Russian writer Nadezhda Mandelstam, who wrote to the Jewish author and historian Ilya Arenberg, she wrote these words. You know, she said, there is a tendency to accuse you of not reversing the rivers, of not changing the course of the stars, of not breaking up the moon in honey cakes and feeding us the pieces. In other words, people always wanted the impossible from you and were angry when you did the possible. I chose that title because what Nadezhda said of Aaron Berg could be said of every human rights worker or every toiler for social justice as well. It's true, we will never succeed in reversing the river. But what we can do is to make that river a little cleaner, its course a little wider, and its waters a common favor for us all. That's what I tried to do for those 12 years. That's what many of you try to do every day of your lives. And for that, I thank you for trying to clean the river. And now for me to say.
Thank you. So I hope that gives you a little taste of what the book is about. That Those remarks are adapted from the last chapter. Some of you have been reading the book and I've told you don't read the last chapter <laughs> after you hear my remarks or you fall asleep on me. But uh, there is uh, a lot more in the book and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. But we have a few minutes here and if you have questions or comments, I'd be glad to respond. Bill? Hi, Mary. Hi, is there a 